and welcome to Off The Fence, brought to you in association with Bet365. This is your weekly rundown of all things jump racing. And we have an awful lot to get through in this episode of the show, because not only are we going to be looking at the Dublin Racing Festival this coming weekend, but we're also going to be looking at the anti-post market for the Cheltenham Gold Cup. And of course, we've got our offence section this week as well. So plenty to get through, and we're going to start by looking back at what happened where this last seven days in jump racing in Ireland and England uh, and we're going to go straight in to Doncaster and reflect on Shishkin winning the Lightning Novices chase up there. Uh, it was job done essentially Barry and he did it in style. I'm not sure he could have been much more impressive. What did you make of it? No it was very good. I saw some people cribbed him a little bit for, for going fractionally left and he races behind the bridle. He's, he's a lazy horse, but when Nico switched him on in the straight, he floated down the straight and he was pinpoint accurate over the last four. You couldn't ask for better. He showed loads of scope. Um, but above all, he was accurate. You know, the last fence, he just ran down, danced, and he was landed running at the far side. So he was very impressive in the finish. There's probably times during the race when he just racing a little bit lazily. And Doncaster, when it's soft, drying ground, it's not very deep, but it's very dead. And I think he's a horse who appreciates nice ground and he probably wasn't as comfortable on it as he would be, albeit he was getting through it. So it was a good solid performance in the finish and he's definitely, he's, he's, he's entitled to be favourite for the Arkham. Now for me, Barry, obviously lots of people draw comparisons with him and other stable stars from Nicky Henderson's and none more so really than Sprinter Sacra and specifically so because of course we once saw Sprinter Sacra up at Doncaster over the chase fences. For me personally, uh, I I don't think Shishkin has that real like one in a million kind of wow factor that Sprinter had. I think Sprinter was so uh, sort of exuberant and just had something completely different. Whereas you actually touched upon it there. Shishkin is more kind of, he's very, he's kind of, he's got the scope, but he's economical and he's quick and he sort of dances in front of the boards when he needs to. Just from your point of view, and obviously having the relationship with Sprinter, uh, what are the comparisons between the two? Uh, what do you see that's similar and what do you see that's very different maybe? Well, obviously, he's a very good horse, like Sprinter was as well. Um, but he, he's possibly more in the mould of Altior, who later in his career has, has, has raced behind the bridle, and that's his way. He's, he's half flat to the boards, but comes alive late on, where Sprinter, from day one, you know, he, he attacked fences, he charged, and he was, he was that way the whole way through his career. So he, he just ran with more enthusiasm. Um, I don't think Shishkin would just quite have the same size and scope as Sprinter and Altior. He jumps brilliantly. He's very measured. He's not. He's not overly economical, if you like. He's not diving out to the top of them. He's a good, solid jumper, but he's probably not as flamboyant as Altior or Sprinter. Um, but he's definitely got a lot of class. And just final question then to you about Shishkin. If if there was anything at all you thought he could improve on, what would it be? I mean, obviously, just for him personally, rather than the ground bringing out an improvement or right or left-handed, is there anything you thought, oh, he could just be a touch better there? No, I don't think so. And even he jumped fractionally left at times. Um, it, when that wasn't an issue at Kempton when he was going right-handed, it's never going to be an issue for me. So, no, I think he's, he's, he's as professional as you can get the way he came down over the last four fences. You don't see novices jumping as well as that very often. So no, there's not much you could do with him. Okay, well, uh, Tony, over what at the moment, he's an incredibly short price favourite for the Arkle. Uh, what was your impression of Shishkin at the weekend? What did you make of the performance? Yeah, just basically what Barry said there, very impressive. I suppose the interesting thing were, to me were what Nicky Henderson was saying after it, just what it says about his personality. I just quote this from Lee Mothershead in the race and post. He says, watching the race, it was no fun whatsoever, absolutely horrible, everything to lose and, and very little to gain. Well, I don't know about you, if I, I train, if not that I'd ever train a horse but, or even owned a horse that was one to seven for a grade two, I think I'd be watching it pretty comfortably. But it, it's just interesting that his kind of emotions um, around this, like we know his kind of extreme preciousness. Um, with, with these horses, with the with these top horses, and maybe he he another trainer that might see a a, a bad run as more kind of expendable, um, 
it, it doesn't bother him. But Barry, do you think that has made him a, a better trainer or the trainer he is, taking that kind of approach, like wanting to kind of preserve these almost perfect records and stuff like that? Um, has it sort of made him the great Cheltenham trainer that he is? Well, it does in a way. You know, he, he wants the right target for the horse to put the horse in the right place. So he wants that, that run in Doncaster to be the perfect prep. And he wants to have him in two weeks' time where he wants him and he wants to work from there. So it's very much his approach. But Nicky's been stuck at home, not able to go racing, and he's probably climbing the walls to be involved. And it's hard enough. It's e- it was always easy as a jockey because you just went out, you were in the moment, there were split-second decisions, you didn't have time to think about it. But as a trainer, you're standing on the sidelines, or as the owner. And it's probably bad enough if you have a busy day's race and then you're standing on the sidelines for the few minutes in the stands. But if you're stuck at home all day watching the clock, are we nearly there? And he's got a, an odds-on shot. You know, the, the, the better the horse, the more the pressure for him. So it's, it's just how he, he's probably climbing the walls at the minute to, to get going himself. Oh, poor Nicky, not taking it well, the old lockdown. <laughs> um, we can move on to a bit of the Irish action and pick out a few highlights from the last seven days. Tony, uh, just in the novice chase division, a horse that caught your eye, or I think you're impressed with, this Eclat de Rear. Uh, what did you make of him at the weekend? Yeah, uh, I think he was much the best jumper um, of that field. Um, Scary 10 made a few errors, pencil full of lead, didn't really jump on any fluency, which was a little bit surprising. Um, but he was basically still on the bridle until the last. He, he never saw the whip, um, one with plenty in hand, I, I would say. And look, going to Cheltenham, I suppose the worry with him is going to be a little bit lack of experience. Uh, he's only had the two chase starts and I think the only two hurdles runs as well. But Lindo was was not dissimilar last year, uh, only having had the couple of chase runs and went close. I think he could do with settling a little bit better, but I would much prefer now to, to back him for the festival and obviously chasing something like latest exhibition. Like latest exhibitions, is, he seems to be getting these tons and tons of column inches. And his trainer's quite good with the media, I know that, and he's willing to talk and all this type of stuff. But I I, I don't know how he beats Monkfish. Uh, all all things been equal. Um, and if I was looking for a way into this, race, I see he's a second favourite. I would kind of looking to oppose him in some way, shape, or form because it, it reminds me a little bit of um, Jeski and Hurricane Fly. Uh, maybe once upon a time he'll beat him, but just at the moment when Monkfish is absolutely thriving, I, I, I just kind of see him getting farther ahead and, and they can kind of thrive with the like. So maybe a clat the rear would, would, be a, would be a better way into that race, uh, a totally different farm line um, to try and get the, the, the Ricci horse beaten. Yeah, I like it, something different. Um, and Barry, I wanted to touch upon Alaho's performance at Thurless at the, uh, in the week, the rescheduled race. Uh, won it nicely, but this is a horse who I think we touched upon it last week when we discussed the race. It's this kind of he he the seems to he seems to come to the race course with a big reputation, and I know he won, but he's now six to one for the Ryanair with bet three six five. Would you be with him against Min, or is that a ridiculous statement to be making at this stage? No, well, obviously the the price puts him there at the head of the market alongside Min, really. Um, but personally, I'd be for Min myself. I thought. Aloha was a good performance. He beat Ellie May. I think he was giving her two pound, where he'd be giving her seven, um, any other day with a mare's allowance. So, um, it was a good performance. I thought his style of racing. I wasn't just fully convinced it's going to suit him in a competitive weight race like the Ryanair. He goes hard from the front, and I think he could pay the price for that. Um, so for me, I think Min. He's been there. He's got all the class. He'd be happy to 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 follow Aloha, I'd imagine. And, and rub it off him so I think he's a very good horse and it was a good performance but if he gave me the choice I'd be with Min yeah I'm I'm with you on that one I'm afraid for me I definitely don't have the faith in Alaho but that might be being a bit harsh at this stage uh Tony keeping with that race though because now I'm going to bring in Ellie May uh and then of course we call we saw Cole Reeve as well um just in terms of that like mare's chase form they're both four to one at the moment with bet 365 for the mare's chase um, what's your view of those form lines, the mares, that sort of chase division at this stage? Yeah, well, I, I think there might well have been a Cheltenham winner running the Alaho race, but it's probably more likely to be Ellie May. I suppose the difference between Ellie May and Alaho, Alaho is now going to have to go up in grade, whereas Ellie May is kind of dropping down in grade. I think, I think that's quite important. Um, I think the co- comparative time performances would reflect a lot better on Ellie May than on Colrevi. And initially after the race, like... 
Ali Mia was nearly twice the price of Colerive. You know, the market has corrected itself to, to a large degree, but I would still have Ali Mia, I think, ahead of Colerive for, for a few different reasons. Um, they actually, all, although Ali Mia is, is in her second season of offences, uh, both of them have actually got the same amount of uh, chase runs at three each, although you would expect, well, in theory, anyway, with Willie Mullins, Ali Mia has done more schooling. But what, there are a couple of other things there that are, are sort of playing into it. There's going to be a penalty structure in that mare's chase. Colreevy's going to have a £5 grade 1 penalty, whereas Ellie May's going to only have a £3 uh, grade 2 penalty. So that's a little bit of an edge for her. Um, I also have the suspicion that Colreevy may be better on really deep ground. Um, I think Limerick really suited her at um, Christmas, as it had done the previous Christmas. And then there's also this, this cloud hanging over Colreevy that there's a possibility that she may not go to Cheltenham. Um, now, I'm not convinced about that myself because I think the owners, I believe, lobbied for her to run in the Grade 1 over Christmas. So they may not accept her going back to Limerick for, let's be honest, a bike race the Sunday after, after Cheltenham um, when, she, when she can be going. When she can be going, when she can be going for a, gra a graded race on the Friday at Cheltenham, you, like, you kind of need to be going for that. Willie Mullins tr has a bit of a tradition of getting his way with owners um, and he seems to be kind of publicly lobbying for... Um, you know, we're going to Limerick, which is just, that's what he does. That, that's what he does. That's going to be an interesting dynamic. Now, they don't, they don't have a lot of horses with Willie the, 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 the Flins. I think that might be the only horse to have them. Bloody good one to have, though. Um, but, yeah, I, I think all those little things added together, the ground, the penalty, the slight possibility, Colreevy not running, I, I would definitely favour Ellie May. Of course, the other one to throw into the mix, the horse who isn't going to have a penalty if she runs is Benny the Jew. But uh, I just would have me doubts about it. I, I, Speaking of trainers and connections, been precious. Um, I definitely read something in the past about them not wanting to run her over fences. Um, and I don't really know that they're going to pitch her in having had so little, so uh, such little experience over fences into that race on a trip that's sharp enough for her. Now she, she to me at this point looks a three miler. Like her, her big performance in recent years was the Galmoy. Um, and thought she caught a little bit of the trip along with the tactical race in the Mayor's Horde last year. So I don't know if she's going to pitch up there. I think an Ellie May will, I would expect her to be the favourite on the day. Very interesting. Uh, Barry, quick line from you. Would you agree with that? Are you an Ellie May fan at this stage? Yeah, I would. And I'd, I'd put the difference, you know, simply down to ground as well. I think Kulrivi really tries on softer, heavy ground, and she may have the edge in those conditions, but she's not likely to get those at Cheltenham. So Ellie May for me just has that little bit of class. Great. Well, look, they're both four to one currently. So based on both the expert opinions on this panel, Ellie May is the one. Um, let's move on. Those are just a few of the highlights that we enjoyed from the last seven days. But now it is a time to look forward. And last week, regular viewers will know that we previewed the anti-post market for the champion hurdle. And this week, we're going to look ahead to Cheltenham again. And we're going to focus our attentions on the Gold Cup itself. Uh, it's an interesting market in many ways, and there seems to be a sort of, there's many different characters in the cast, essentially. You've got the returning hero in Album Photo. You've got a Plutard, who obviously was so impressive at Christmas. Another Indo, who needs to do the business this weekend. Santini, who seems to have got this sort of time form squiggle next to his name, dare I say. Um, and then, of course, the novices, Royal Pagai. You've got Champ in there as well. For me personally, I'm Album Photo all day long. Um, if you maybe have a bet right now, it will be with Album Photo. Uh, he's not done a huge amount wrong, but Tony... Where would you be looking currently as the market stands? Do you think the market is right is my first question. And if you were to have a bet or seek a bit of value right now, where would you be going? Yeah, I'm going to be quite boring. I think this market is, is pretty accurate. Um, we talked last week with the champion hurdle. I think you can definitely make a case evidence a moderate favour for the champion hurdle, especially with the news actually coming out this week that she had, had a back issue after camp. And, and, and through her, you can probably make a case of silver streakers on the yeah. price. So... Um, so I think you can definitely start picking at horses at prices in that race. It, it's very hard to say. How can you say Alboom Fault with three and a half to one is a bad favourite? What would you be holding against him? Um, the fact that it's hard to win three gold cups while well, he's very lightly raced. So yeah, I, I can't can't really say he's a bad price. Um, Manella Indo is he a bad price? Well, I would have thought eight or nine to one was perfectly reasonable going into um, the Savills of Christmas. He didn't do anything wrong. He just only ran halfway through the race. We will find out more about him on um, Sunday as an as an absolute hard backer. I would love to see either Kemba or Mellon beat him four or five lengths within a, in a cleanly run race. That's purely 
selfish punter talk. You, you know my opinion on a Plutard. Uh, he's he's the horse I've liked for long, but his price is probably a bit right now. You've covered Centennial and Champ there quite well. I suppose sometimes we get drawn into too much talking about the front end of the market. Is there any rag there that you'd give a little bit of a chance to? I think Mellon, um, for all that he doesn't win very often or win at all, to be quite honest, um, has still got a lot of potential up at three miles under a slightly more restrained ride. We know he's very effective at Cheltenham. Um, I'd be interested to see how he gets on on Sunday. And I, I know this is absolutely mad, and you were laughing at me mentioning this horse before the, the podcast. Is it 2016? 2016, you're going back to. But um, I always thought they should have gone straight from. Um, the Betfair chase to the Cheltenham Gold Cup at Bristol to May. Um, I think he's a different horse for us. Maybe he's not just a Cheltenham horse. But uh, it would be interesting to see if they didn't bother going for that rescheduled Cotswold, what type of shape he'd turn up to um, in mid-March at Cheltenham. But yeah, it's a, it's a race, to be honest, that I, I would have no uh, no great graph for having a bet in at the minute. See, that's why we have you on the show, Tony, for that exact reason. Bristol de May. Here we go. We're in 2021 and Bristol de May is, you know, <laughs> giving a good shout to him. And how could we argue with you? Because you're just, you know, a hero in this department. So there you have it. Barry, match that, please. <laughs> um, no, I would obviously agree with Album Photo. That's, that's an easy one and he's rock solid. Um, Manila Indo and Champ, that novice, the RSA form, you know, it has to be proven and we'll see what Manila Indo does at the weekend and we'll see what Champ does the following weekend. Um, but I think Santini, he's a horse. I don't know why everyone cribs at him so much. He was rock solid in the Cotswold chase last year. He ran a cracker in the Gold Cup off a slow pace on good ground. I think off a stronger pace and a bit more juice in the ground, he could have beaten Album Photo. So for me, he's probably at the, at the top end of the market. He's the one who might represent a little bit of value because he's been there and he's very, very nearly done it. Yeah, I mean, it's a fair point. In all seriousness, I'm a bit rude about him. A lot of people are a little bit rude about him. And actually, you know, when you watch back last year's Gold Cup, you can't really slag him too much given the way the race was run. So I think that's fair cop. Um, but viewers, please head over to the Cheltenham Festival mega site on At The Races. Uh, a lot of effort's gone into it from the team behind the scenes and you have loads on there from all sorts of columns, uh, facts, stats, anti-post betting, anything you like. The Cheltenham Festival mega site on At The Races is where you want to be heading for all the build-up to the big week in March. Uh, but in the near future, we need to focus on the Dublin Racing Festival, and that is where we are heading next, because this weekend, normally I head over to Ireland for this these two days, and honestly, it is the best two days of the year for me. Actually, it's the best three or four days of the year because I tend to go to the Dublin Racing Festival for two days and then I head down to Clonmel for the dogs. And honestly, it's just a heaven sent week. Not so this week, but instead we have plenty of action to look forward to on the track. And Barry, the aforementioned Manella Indo goes in the Irish Gold Cup. Now, for me, he needs to put something on the table here. He needs to prove something now. He needs to deliver something. Uh, a clear round would be great, obviously, for starters. But just looking at the market, you know, you've got Kenboy in there and Mellon. I, I think every, I don't, I don't know, everyone's very keen on Manella Indo, whereas for me, he's got a few questions to answer here. And I personally would be going with Mellon. Uh, but where, where's your, where are you landing on this one, please? Yeah, no, I mean, Lindo, he has to step up to the plate. Um, obviously, a faller last time. You know, he's, he's, he's still going on potential. So if he is going to be, you know, deservedly second favourite for the Gold Cup, I think he has to go and win in Leperstown on Sunday and win well. Um, Mellon is a good horse. Kenboy is a good horse. Kenboy is particularly good around Leopardstown and probably Cheltenham mightn't be his course. Um, Mellon was possibly the unlucky horse on reflection in Leprous on the last day. He was very untidy at the second last. He got racing fairly early down the back straight and it maybe just left him vulnerable late on. So, you know, they're, they're good, solid yardsticks around Leprous but I think if Manila Indo is going to be a Gold Cup challenger and a proper Gold Cup challenger, he needs to beat these. Um, you know, it's hard to see past the top three in the market. Um, but for me, Manila Indo, he has to go and win and win a couple of lengths and win like a good horse. Yeah, and uh, Tony, you've already kind of touched upon how you want this race to go uh, for you personally. <laughs> but in terms of, well, actually, just the, just the quick line, 
Manella Indo Barry's just said there that he needs to win this race and he needs to win it well to justify his price in the Cheltenham Gold Cup market currently. Uh, do you think that's likely, I guess, straight down the line? Would you be with him or against him? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm a bit, uh, I just, uh, no, I don't have a strong opinion. I, I'm kind of going to be on it, up front of it this meeting. Um, the cup, there's I have two points I want to make up this meeting. The first thing is the ground is going to be very different to what it's been the last um, two years at Leperstown when there's been issues with withdrawals and it's been too fast, particularly on the chase course, all this type of stuff. Now, this season, it, it, there's obviously it's done nothing but rain for, for a month. Um, I, still, I see it's still yielding in places on the Leperstown chase course, of course it is, but uh, over it's, it's probably going to be as, as bad as they're going to get it there. Now, the knock-on effect of that to me is that I think the form from Leperstown will work out better than it has done the last two Cheltenhams and also the fact that I do, t I do, yeah, because the last two years have been quite, Ch Dublin Racing Festival been quite a moderate guide to Cheltenham. Um, I also think the trainers will be very willing to run their horses this, this weekend, which they've been a little bit mm, not so keen on it the last couple of years. So as regards anti-post bets and anti-post opinion, now usually this these couple of days I'd be eyeing up something and I'd be, yeah, well if there wasn't a lockdown on, I'd be running around a few shops trying to get a few quid on, but that that's kind of a problem. But anyway, um, <laughs> I, I don't think there's any great rush to have a bet in any of these markets because I think that the overrounds are probably quite high and I think a lot of the horses are going to turn up anyway and you can just bide your time and wait until Saturday morning, Sunday. I think the price is then will be quite fine. So I don't think there's any real need to go charging in because I think there, there will be a willingness of trainers to take each other on and even horses from the same yard to take each other on. Okay. No panic stations for us then midweek. Just bide our time. Wait till Saturday and Sunday. Lovely job indeed. But Tony, I'm going to stick with you. Let's talk about the Irish champion hurdle. Another real headline act at the weekend. We get to see Honeysuckle. Uh, everyone's looking forward to seeing the superstar mare. But <laughs> tell me, Tony, where are you going with this race, please? Uh, look, uh, you were laughing at me with Bristol the May <laughs> earlier. You're, you're, you're definitely going to be laughing at me with this one. The... the, the... What's the, what it is, the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Um, That's what they say. Them. That is yeah, what they so, say. So, so they say. Um, Petit Mouchoir has been banging his head against the wall in these grade ones for a long time, but he's the outsider of the field. Yeah, I thought he actually ran the best trail for this of any of them at Christmas in the Charger race. Um, have to bear in mind he's coming off a break he hadn't run since the Galway Hurdle, which, which was really was an excellent run. Um, some people were giving Adam on a life in the champion hurdle. Um, he had changed trainers in between then. He's old, but it's not inconceivable that Gordon Elliott could have improved a, a horse from another yard, albeit a top one. It does happen. But there was a key thing that happened uh, it was on the run to the second last, or just after the second last. He, he was there kind of, to me, cynical mind that he am, he was there to kind of chaperone Abacadabra through the race. Um, and he got squeezed out quite badly. Jockey seemed quite happy to let him come back through the field. And it looked like he was just going to back out of it completely. But he rallied and he stayed on very well for Tord. Considering he's going, he was going against a lot of horses that are race fit there, um, I thought that was an excellent effort. He loves Leperstown two miles. He's actually a brilliant record there. Um, I know he's stupid prices for a champion hurdle. I don't really think he can win a champion hurdle, but I think I'll probably pay to find out on Saturday um, if he can rattle a few. He's definitely in the place markets, the, the, the two to be placed and the three to be placed. I, I, I think he's got a, a better chance in the odds in play for all that winning has been proved difficult for him in the last few years. Who am I to argue with you, Tony? I love that. There you go. You've said it. And I'm, you know, Bristol to my, and now this. What else can happen on this show today? Uh, Barry, quick line from you. Any view on this in particular, with or against Honeysuckle, please? Yeah, I think the ground is a big key here. And although be it was soft the last day when Charger won, there's variations of soft and it can be close to heavy. I think the slower it is, the more it will suit Honeysuckle. Um, I don't think she's at her best going left-handed back to two miles. I think she's better up on trip and ideally going right-handed. Um, but the slower ground, I think, will counteract that for her. But the better side of soft it is, I think, the, the better it is for Sharjah. So they're the two for me, really, to be honest. OK, well, let's stick with you, because I know you're looking forward to seeing an argument in the Irish uh, Arkle. Now, we've spoken about Shishkin's put his sort of marker down in terms of the Arkle in uh, March. But here, what does this horse need to do to really, well, short, well, what does this horse need to do at the weekend, essentially? 
Um, I'd suppose better ground would have been a, a better test, really, for what I was thinking for him as regards Cheltenham. I think he's a big threat to um, Shishkin in Cheltenham. Ooh. He's a horse who really excites me. Um, but he's got his ideal conditions on, at the weekend, which would have been very soft. So I'd imagine he'll have no problem getting through it. He's a very good horse. He jumps really well. He loves soft ground. I just was hoping to see him on better ground to get a better idea of how he'd be against Shishkin, presuming we have better ground at Cheltenham. But... Um, no, he's a horse that excites me, and I think he's. I think you'll see his price tumble after the weekend for the Arkham. Very interesting. I like that a lot. So yeah, it's a big shout, Barry. Um, definitely taking that on board. Tony, quick word from you on the handicaps. Uh, it's going to be competitive markets left, right, and centre in these, but I know you've picked out a few. Yeah, a couple of horses that I've probably mentioned before on the show here. Um, I thought it was quite interesting that Far, Farclad didn't run in the Tiestes last week. I think Jack Kennedy was quite surprised he got on the winner anyway. I think he'd been looking forward to riding Farclad in it. But I thought in the Paddy Power Christmas, he didn't quite get home. Some of that was it was a slow pace and he didn't help himself and he, he never settled. But I also thought he weakened a bit um, after the last. I think going back to 2.5, 2.5 in the Leopardstown chase on Sunday might suit him better. I definitely think... Goran on, on really heavy ground that re, that would have found him out a little bit the other horse I think again I also mentioned before he's a hardy bloke Noel Mead's horse who has improved markedly since the tongue tie gone on he's going in the, the Ladbrook Cordell on, on Saturday at least as an entry at the moment uh, I think that kind of race to suit him um, very well provided his hurdle and holds up Okay, something to put in the notebook for sure. Uh, my two that I, well, first horse I'm thoroughly looking forward to seeing, which I'm sure many people are, is of course Monkfish, taking on latest exhibition again. And I guess, Barry, I like the I like it when two horses keep meeting because I think that, you know, inevitably the horse that keeps getting beaten will try something different. Uh, what can latest exhibition do tactically around Leopardstown that would get him maybe closer to Monkfish, if anything? Or is it just as a simpler case as Monkfish is just a much better horse than latest exhibition? I think a head start is his only way. Um, but he, he, is a, he is a good horse, latest exhibition, but I think Monkfish is a very good horse. So it's, you know, he's, he's a bridge to to gap there and you know I don't think he's going to do it unless Monkfish um, you know puts in a below par performance okay let's put me in my place then uh, Tony another another race I'm really looking forward to seeing is the Spring Juvenile uh, it's a division that we've spoken quite a, a bit about on this podcast I'm not entirely sure who's going to show up but you I like the sort of Looking at them, you've got Zana here, who's obviously just put his marker in the sand very early in this division and then has stayed there. But then Quilixios and French Asile come here off the back of very impressive, but in pretty low grade races, but a win all the same, wide margin victories. Where would you be going in this race yourself? Um, what's your view on it? Um... It would be an amazing race if they all torn up. I'm not sure that they will. Look at the bet, and you, you would think Santa here would be shorter if he's going to run. Uh, although I see Gordon Elliott mentioning over the weekend that he doesn't intend running Zana here against um, Colexius. I also, as I mentioned before, like Willie Mullins' team might like a little bit more time with French Asile. But there are loads of other interesting horses. Like the two horses that ran a fairy house, um, Yumder of Willie Mullins and Tihupu. I'd like to see those two um, go at it again. I know Yumder was travelling the better, but that Tihupu really finished the race out well. His time was notably good. Like they, they wouldn't to be underestimated if there was no Zana here in it. So yeah, that, that, that's that's going to be, a even if the, the absolute principles don't turn up, that, that could be a really good race. Yeah, it's going to be competitive throughout. Uh, it's a weekend. We've just flown through a few of the highlights the three of us are personally looking forward to. But of course, we don't have time to give it the full sort of big two-day preview. But all the same, uh, Plenty to get your teeth stuck into there, hopefully. Barry, quick rattle through Sandown. Obviously, we've got a load of rescheduled races this weekend. We're not going to go into the Cotswold Chase or the Cleve Hurdle because we review we looked at them last week, and so it's much the same field. Uh, so if you want to know our opinions on that, then please head over to last week's podcast, uh, last week's show. Uh, Barry, yeah, just wanted to do a quick line from you on the Silly Isles, please. Uh, good few line up there, but Sham Blue's at the head of the market for the Skeletons. That Messier, the Zabo, uh, the older sort of novice horses in there as well is very impressive. Where would you be going here? Who are you looking forward to seeing? I think it's a very competitive race. Um, Shan Blue, 
I kind of had to question the strength of the form at Kempton, um, you know, beating the big break away. And if the Caps fits, who never travelled at all, was back in third. So I wasn't so sure about that. Al Art won really well in Ascot before he fell in Haydock. Hitman, albeit he is a, a smaller allowance this time as a five year old, he's three pounds rather than six, but he stayed on really well in the Henry VIII. So I think the step up and trip is going to suit him. Um, Messer de Zobo was rock solid both days. He's won and he possibly has the highest level of hurdle form maybe back in the day. So I think it's a very competitive race um, and a tricky one, but I, I just wouldn't be sure about the favourite. Okay, taking on the favourite, uh, deep field indeed. And I know also, Barry, you were, ple- uh, you were looking forward to sort of, well, giving a special mention to the contenders hurdle, because if we do see Goshen back, I mean, this is the horse who, in terms of the champion hurdle, uh, still has this big question mark over him. But fundamentally, somewhere inside him, we know he is a very, very talented individual. But we need to see him back on track here. We've been saying it all season, but we really do now, don't we? Oh, definitely. And, he, you know, he, he blew all chance in Cheltenham and it was very disappointing and he had a heart issue as well then. Um, hopefully he gets to Sando and gets to run and he's there and he's healthy and well. Um, but I think going right-handed is a help for him. Um, he does hang a little bit to his right. And by doing so, going left-handed, he's always pulling to the right, which always keeps him in Jamie's hands. Rather than getting him to relax, he's, he's fighting to go right. Um, so I think going right-handed around Sandon, which he's done before on heavy ground, and it's been ideal for him. Also, heavy ground itself, in it by its nature, is a steadier ship, if you like. Horses don't race maybe as competitively as they would on better ground. So all those things are going to help him relax. And I think we're more likely to see the real gosh. And if ever we're going to see it, I think you have a great chance of seeing it on Saturday. And you have song for someone who's favourite, who is a very good horse. He's your yardstick then. So if Goshen can can run a big race against Song for Summon or even beat him, you know, Goshen is back home places again. Yeah, and his price will tumble. That's actually so interesting what you say about the right left handed and the drifting and the sort of ability to settle when you're pulling one way or the other. Um, right, viewers, get involved. As always, what are your best bets for the weekend? Who are you looking forward to seeing at the Dublin Racing Festival at Sandown up at Weatherby? Uh, get involved, please. Comments, as always, in the YouTube comment section on Facebook, on Twitter, wherever you like. Just get in touch with all of us, please. We love it. We love to hear from you. Very quickly now, we're going to move on to offence, our offence section. What have we taken offence to this week? Well, uh, one thing in particular seems to be grabbing the headlines, and this is the start issue over at uh, over in Ireland, but specifically at Nace at the weekend. Uh, Tony, it's all a bit of a mess. It's a little bit of an embarrassment for you guys uh, just at the moment in terms of the starts. What's going on over there? What's happening? Yeah, it's it's just very unfair on those horses and, and everyone connected with them that have been really just shafted by the start. Um, it's all just always very poor. Kevin O'Reilly uh, on, on Racing TV went and asked the starter, would he come on? And I think his response was, not a chance. Um, that doesn't really cut it nowadays. And I don't think ever in the history of humanity has it ever been a good response not to put your hands up and say you've made a mistake and instead choose to either deny it or put your head in the sand and say it never happened. Um, so the IHRB, uh, they're not in a great spot at the minute now. They've had a couple of very real scandals in the last while um, they don't really seem to have a coherent strategy for dealing with it they're not getting out in front of it Dennis Egan was on um, RTE over Christmas didn't really clarify a lot of the things on the on the performance enhancing drugs are they going to be out this weekend and, and, and trying to get in front of it and, and do a proper job on it but the, the credibility is re- I'd say probably at an all time low at the minute so uh, I, I suppose around the technicality to start I would be interested in hearing, hearing Barry's views on that um, as regards the jockeys and, and what can be done to improve that and how does this happen like obviously it's easy to see why it did happen in this case there was a, a horse that was loose for 20 minutes beforehand and they wanted to try and catch up time not that the starter wanted to be home for his tea or anything like that I hope but um yeah, the, the, that's not good. That's still that's still not good enough. You know, you, you just have to get the thing, get that type of thing right. So I would be interested in Barry's views from a jockey's point of view, but what they can do. Yeah, no, it it was it was it was desperate to watch. Um, and there was no fault to the jockeys. The jockeys lined up and they were making their way to the start. And then Philip Enright's horse 
before they got anywhere close to the tape, ducked right, brought two horses with him. And then a few seconds later, the starter proceeds to let them go. So whether the three horses ducking away with the big field were out of his view at the actual time when he let the tape go, he should have seen them literally a second or two later and he should have called a false start. Instead, he just let them run. So it was it was desperate to watch. It was desperate for all connections. It was desperate for anyone who backed any of those three horses. Um, and no, it was, it was shambolic, really. But when you're down at the start, Barry, if you're in the sort of main clutch of the field and obviously you don't you don't you don't know anything of what's going on behind you, um, is is there any confusion in those moments? Because surely the lads that have been taken out or the lads that are involved in the debacle, there must be some shouting or something. Is is there is it confusing when you're down there? Or is it just as simple as they said go, so we're going? That's pretty much it. You hear the shouting, you hear the roars you know lads could have been shouting anything about my horse is gone he's ducked or someone's on the ground but if you're on front and as the winner was and he's out the gate all he wants to see is the flag in front of him stay down because if there's three or four less in the race that's three or four less to beat so it makes it easier so you have your head down you keep going until someone tells you otherwise so you know you, it's an opportunist you are as a jockey but the starter it's completely down to starter to to make the right call and this was the wrong call yeah, and I bet it doesn't. Then you must just walk back if you are, if you have sort of been one of the lads that's hard done by, sick as a dog, but also just fuming with the situation. It needs sorting out. It's a bit like a few of the other things we've spoken about on the show recently. We live in twenty twenty one. Got to get some of this stuff right because you know the times are changing. Um, right. Did you take offence to this, viewers? Get involved again. We want to hear from you. And in the meantime, it's our tracker time. We're going to fly through this very quickly because we are running out of time, but we do need to flag up the fact that Tony is our hero, essentially. <laughs> he has given us no fewer than four winners in the tracker section so far. Uh, that is pretty good going. We've had 11 shows and he's flagged up four future winners for us. So what more could you ask for really? So essentially whatever Tony tells us, just, just put it in your tracker, just do it because it's a winner clearly. Uh, Barry's been going well as well. He's had one winner with Imperial Alcazar and a few more to run for him. And as for me, you know, there's no need to dwell on that. Let's just stick with Tony. Uh, Tony, please, can I have some more winners this week? Yeah, yeah. Um, I wish he actually had backed all of these, um, uh, especially Mr. <laughs> Hend Hendricks last week. I did, I, 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 I did back one or two of them, and definitely Percy Warner was probably pretty fortunate. But anyway, I'm feeling a bit of pressure this week. I was struggling a bit. I didn't put up one last week, so I said I, I, said I was yeah. going to go with two. I said I was going to have two this week, and I have two, but I'm not sure about either of them. <laughs> Uh, the first one is um, a winner. Euro Tiap won the maiden hurdle at Torles last week. A um, couple of angles with him. I think he was quite. Uh, he was just an ordinary bumper horse um, in his first go round. He had two goals and he was well beaten. But looks a different horse um, since he's had a bit of a break. Won his bumper, then beaten just by hollow games, and then he's won here um, at Torles. I think one of the features that sort of has me interested in him, the, he was second favourite in the race and the favourite vintage Prosecco who looks at an absolutely awful raid, to be honest. He's so keen and possibly settle. He took off in the middle part of the race, um, but Euro Tiep was actually able to go with him and stay going and win easily, despite having made, gone at this, I'd say, crazy gallop in the middle part of the race. Now, the other thing, a reason why I think he may be missed a bit, a little bit, is his jockey. Um, Aubrey McMahon rides him. Uh, it's actually his first winner over hurdles. He'd be sort of felt that wouldn't be getting a lot of respect in the market. Um, and he seemed perfectly capable on this horse and did things right. And this horse is quite talented. So you just would wonder if that, somebody would say, oh, Aubrey McMahon's riding that. Uh, he's still claiming and whatever. And against very experienced pros, he could be interesting. I think that probably the race long term for him is the one of Punchstown, the... He basically has won the qualifier for that at Taurus. That the the red is the red mills um the sort of the, the the cap at for sales prices for horses. So he's qualified qualify for that. The other horse um I like uh, three stripe life was obviously brilliant in winning at Navin uh, in the bumper on Friday. But I quite like the horse that was second to him, the Sharks horse uh, whose name is Gibson, uh, Outlaw Peter. I'd say the form is quite solid. The horse that was in toured had good maiden hurdle form beforehand. The horse that was in fourth had been second to Gary Colombi before that, but. Three stripe life seemed to be absolutely powering down the hill, but um, Outlaw Peter went with him to the four long pole, travelled quite well, and then the Elliot horse just ran away from him. But definitely, I would think a, 
a run of the mill bumper at this time of the season would be well within the scope of uh, Shark Hand and Sort. Like it, like it a lot, and due to the fact you're in rattling good form, you're a TF and Outlaw Peter in the tracker. They go, Barry. Uh, quickly, your tracker horse, please, this week. I've gone for a bit of an obvious one. I went for Aaron's Day, who was second in the <laughs> Shambolic race and this. So he, uh, he gave a 30 length head start. He got back to within four lengths of the winner, and I believe he gets a four pound raise. So I need to play catch up with Tony on the tracker. So I'm, I'm hoping this fella have him one two um, before his 11 month absence. Hopefully, he can get back and win another three and get me back level with Tony. Nice back level, yeah. Well, look, if you're playing catch up, then I am the horse that was left at the start, taken out at the start. That's me currently. Uh, but my tracker horse this week is a horse called Your Darling. Bit of a left field one. I actually saw him at loose schooling at Henrietta Knights in the week, and rarely, I think it's fair to say, have I seen the horse uh, move like that or with such athletic ability over a fence. And he actually beat Flint to Sacra on debut bu uh, in a bumper at Newbury. And then has since essentially disappointed in three runs since a uh, bumper and two novice, novice hurdle races earlier this season. Uh, subsequently, lots of subsequent winners have come out of the race. But essentially what I'm trying to tell you is you're not seeing the best of this horse. Uh, I don't know what's gone wrong with him, but put him in his tracker, put him in your tracker and save him for a later date. Ideally over fences. Uh, I was yeah blown away by his jumping. That would that's would sum it up. Um, so yeah, your darling for me, that is the track of horse. And that about rounds off proceedings here on Off The Fence. Thank you very much for watching as always. Um, get involved, let us know what you think. Uh, it's a huge weekend of racing we've got to look forward to. Thank you very much, Tony Keenan as always, Barry Geraghty as always. That's it, thanks for watching. This was Off The Fence brought to you in association with Bet365.